I uh, hope all the residents of town are doing well or as well as can be expected in this heat and humidity. Um, hopefully it will break soon. And I will just remind everyone to uh, please check on your neighbors. Um, if you haven't seen them for a while, check on your neighbors. Make sure everyone is doing well. Or if you have concern, call the town office building and the police department so they can do a wellness check also. Or we can have the EMS go over. But um, um, one, one of the advantages of high points, good points, whatever you want to call it, of living in a small community is that we do care um, about one another. And I would strongly suggest if you, you see uh, or have a concern, um, please say something to the appropriate people and we will take appropriate actions. And if you don't want your name mentioned, that's fine. We won't mention your names, but it's one of the things that we can do for one another. Um, and or if you are having problems and have nowhere to turn, please call the selectman's office and uh, Sherry will do whatever we can to, to try to fix you up and get, get you into a cooling shelter or, or a place that you can get help. So if you need it, we will try to help. Um, that being said, uh, today is July 25th. We uh, have a regularly scheduled meeting of the Sunderland Board of Selectmen. I'd like to call the order. Uh, first thing up at 6.30 is we have Tom Zimnoski. Tom? who is a chair of the 300th anniversary. Fill us in, Thomas. Uh, we're doing, um, we're very productive so far. We're just organizing. We've had a couple of meetings and uh, hopefully the uh, individuals that are working on committee things are busily doing their thing. But our next meeting is going to be September the 8th, 6 o'clock here. And a couple of things that I just want to take and bring to your attention and or um, ask you about uh, that we need information guidance for our next meeting coming up so I'll be tackling that but uh, before I start on that on a positive note uh, anyone being going to the Sunderland post office to pick up their mail or anything like this has anyone here on the committee been to the Sunderland post oh no no and no and no I have not been to shame that. on you all <laughs> shame on you what are we all. shamed for uh, because you haven't been into the Sunderland post office to notice what we, uh, the historical, Sunland Historical Commission did, and um, we- is, this, uh, is the post office still standing, Tommy? The post office is still standing. <laughs> is, Ronnie still, there, is Ronnie still there? Well, I didn't see him, but I heard his name mentioned, and it was not in vain, so he was still there. Did he turn, uh, the, poker, did he turn the pokers down a little bit? Well, he's got CDs now playing instead, right. so, you know, he's got that. But anyway, so Excellent. we just took and uh, uh, mounted a lovely picture, and it's, um, we are still debating exactly what year it goes back to, and but anyways, it's a panoramic of the town of Sunderland taken from Sugarloaf, and we're kind of figuring it, it has to be before the uh, town hall was built, because if you look at it, you do not see the. Cooper what date was the town hall built, Tom? Huh? Um, it was before 61. 1888, I think. 61. That's as far as I know at this point here, but anyways. Uh, it's a replication from uh, the Pivot Media did from a picture that Linda Lepatka received. Nice. And it was framed up. Who helped up. build it, Tom? Huh? Who helped build it? I don't know. Actually, it was a guy. We have his picture downstairs. I know, well, I, I, I know that, but if I... He was, I, I, he was, he was a business... These are pop quiz he questions was, that I'm I, I'm, just try, I'm just trying <laughs> to... I'm just trying to... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do I have I a button to push? That's a, that was easy. Who is Thomas Jefferson? <laughs> that guy. Yeah, that bing, guy. bing, 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 It's interesting, though, because he, he, was, he was someone that... Um, he was from upstate New York, a farmer from upstate New York that used to spend... His uh, well, time here. Okay, so so basically, you're talking the castle also um, designed the town uh, uh, the town hall. Okay, I, I just okay. think it's in, it's interesting what so. we we forget at one time Sunderland was a uh, destination. A Actually, this whole valley was a destination for many people. Yep, for vacation. So we have a uh, still a media did a <laughs> every night uh, did a reproduction. Took a picture and it's a it was uh, framed cards. Postcards, kind of, and it was a panoramic at that time. They took four pictures, they kind of stuck them together, and uh, they, we were trying to take and figure out how to take and blow this up and mount it. And then we got a heads up for Pivot Media, so we sure. went there. And you know, when you talk to people and we, professional people that do this for a living, and they do it such a great job, 
that when they blew that one up and we looked at it, it was like, oh my God. So it's close to six feet long mm -hmm. and it's mounted above the, it's uh, securely locked, as secure it can be, above the uh, uh, mailboxes. So people going in there 24 hours a day. Nice. Uh, and it does have a card stating at this point here regarding uh, historical commission and also uh, giving the 300th anniversary a little kick. And our goal here is to get a few more of those and or different ones hmm. um, positioned, you know, done up and put throughout the town in business locations or businesses or restaurants so people can take a seat like, oh, wow, look at this. Yeah. And uh, also, geez, it's the 300th coming up. Wonderful. I should do a little gallery in here. But get, well, yeah, we'll have to get up more people. Here. But no, that's 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 one of the things that we want to also take and do. Yeah, the, nice. the one thing is, there's one thing of taking these pictures and then mounting them on foam core, and they're, I don't want to say disposable, right? But here it was mounted. <coughs> the framing of it cost a couple hundred bucks, right. and but when you look at it, and it's like, wow, son of a gun. Huh. So. We're at our next meeting. We'll take and ponder um, doing more of these, but also as the website comes to be developed in that, that if people are looking for purchasing a copy of these, uh, Pivot Media has the files on record. Mm -hmm. We can work out a deal saying that okay, you know, we'll put an order in and to sell these for a possible future fundraiser and that. Or just like but, a link um, on the site. Yeah, you know? there is there is one picture in particular that our, I think probably going to be our next one that uh, it was on a uh, picture, this one was 1888, you saw the date, and once again, the center of town, but the mountains were kind of barren. Mm -hmm. And oh, you know, nice. you looked at it and said, okay, fine, that's nice, you know. And then once he took the picture, and talking about the card in his cameras, he says it's like this, so it takes five minutes to download the information, then another five minutes to upload it on his computer. When he brought it up on the screen, and it was like, we're looking at it, it was like, you could see the rows of hay. You could see almost the tree stumps up, and, and it was like unbelievable the detail that we could not see with our naked eyes, but on the camera it brought forward the detail of the houses and everything. It was really fantastic. So we're really excited about that and uh, working with you know um, the company to take and continue doing these things because he's got these files and you know he'll be sharing with us. So um, it's it's a nice start, but I think uh, take a stop. The lobby is open 24/7 when I gather. So. Stop by, take a look, see, and um, enjoy. Because we had, while we were mounting it, a lot of interest in it. A really a lot of interest. So it was nice. It was nice. So speaking about fundraising. Nice job, Tommy. Yeah. Speaking about fundraising, one of the things that I think uh, Mr. Fine Kevitz brought to our attention at uh, a couple of meetings ago was possibility, and we were just throwing things out, but it kind of just things sometimes stick in our minds, and one of them was like uh, a possibility of. Um, opening up the uh, the leaf pile or the brush pile in the fall for you know a four week session it's four Saturdays in September October or something like this or throughout the month of October for a few hours a day uh, looking for donations as people bring in their stuff it will be manned by you know probably volunteers from the uh, 300th committee um, this is my idea so I would probably head that up during the time period of uh, people coming in to take and drop the stuff off and also make a donation, we'll have start passing out flyers or other types of postcards or activities that we are in, that we have coming possibly in the works. But just to take and start putting the word out in some way, shape, or form. But also to take and use this as a fundraiser. The other thing that we were talking about was the fact that, gee, you know, um, the fire department is has offered to take and have a bonfire of some sort and so people love a bonfire and fire departments love to have a bonfire yeah. um, so we're looking at uh, first of all um, how if this is at all possible to take and open up the leaf dump uh, and the brush pile and then uh, one of the thoughts that we had to go forward with the accumulation of the stuff would be uh, probably uh, New Year's Eve 2016-2017 to take and um, uh, have a bonfire mm -hmm. to take and it would also be tied in with a Christmas tree burning thing or whatever and I'm sure the fire department would love to take and build it up from that point on but also a, a, a suggestion was that uh, the people attending and joining 
that we would have these illumination lanterns that you know you light the yeah. you know, whatever. Like they do in the right. over in Hatfield. Yeah. Right, and um, send special messages or write special messages or so whoever's attending. This would be like the start off of the year, the bonfire and sending the things off and have a, some sort of a celebration built around that to start the uh, to start our 300th anniversary year off. So how do we go about doing this for first of all to get. Um, uh, the leaf pile or whatever to get open for a specific period of time. I'll talk to George, right? Well, the, the big thing with the leaf, the big thing with the leaf pile is that it has to be manned. You're right. Um, and 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 again, the, the biggest reason it has to be manned is because of stuff that people throw away. Exactly. And yep. non-brush. Right. Yeah, because right. we have some problems. And and so. So that would be the, the right. So on, on your side, you'd you'd need to, um, and, and since you're soliciting donations, right? Um, then if we could have people that would want to work to solicit those donations for the thing, right. that would take care of the manning the manning issue. The second thing is that I we have to talk to George about um, not so much with the brush, but with the leaves. The le the leaves can be used by composting by different. By different places they'll take them okay um, so I think we just have to work with George to find a place that would take the leaves or, or maybe even us just bring the leaves up to a place like there, there's different uh, composting areas around so so one of the things you're talking about is that it would be like two separate piles one would be a leaf pile and the other one would be a brush pile oh, well, yeah. somewhat if, if I could we we have had uh, grinding operations the reason that one of the many reasons that pile is in the current status it is, you couldn't burn it any longer. Yeah. And we've had grinding operations come in, and a, a day's worth of grinding is a pretty good fee. But, well, I think we were pretty last time. Right. Yeah. And, and again, I, I would say, in, in when we're talking, I think we'd have to. I think we would have to set requirements on the brush. Mm. Br brush to me is one thing. Somebody, somebody wants to bring a tree. Right, right, exactly. Those are yeah. those are different things, right. and and I think we would just have to right. we have to sit down and have a have a conversation with George, and, I, and I'll be more than happy to go with you, Tommy, to talk to him. Okay, good. About okay. that, you know. So, and, and if you have brush, brush is fine. But right. some of the things that they we get, right. and, and, and again, stumps and whatnot. You know, people are throwing batteries. Uh, well, I remember that meeting where the people dumped. They found oil. I think somebody we, we had we had a we had a thing when we had the when the Scott was talking about the the stump grinder before um, when when we had the stump grinder when we had the stump grinder um, the stump grinder went down because someone had thro someone had deposit of a, a humongous plate of steel in there so yeah so so I think if we, we can we'll make an arrangement you and I can go talk to uh, to George about okay, that good. okay 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 excellent excellent and see if there's something that we can do yeah. Yeah, but uh, anyways, you know, we we're looking at that one th one small thing we do creates yep. advertisement, but also it kind of ties into something else that could possibly be happening that we're we're kind of got penciled in as to oh this is a nice nice idea how will this work? Mm -hmm. yep. So you know whatever's left down there we could use what whatever. But the It'll fire work. department said that. At our last meeting, the representative that was here was that they're very interested in helping out in any way, shape, or form, and yeah, uh, starting fires is a nice thing for them. They, yeah, they, they can <laughs> practice. It Rather be, than putting them out for a change. It would be a practice session. There you go. Right. Excellent. Good job, Tom. Um, the, next thing, the next question that I have is, um, and this popped up from the Memorial Day Parade, anyone walking down, and uh, when I came from here, was working my way down to the cemetery that in front of one of the homes and that stuff, there was parked uh, a number of um, classic cars, I should say, or, you know, yes. whatever. Yep. So, anyways, um, got a thought in mind. Someone used to have a T-Bird. Uh, not me. <laughs> I had a Firebird. Firebird, was, oh yeah, yeah that's right. Um, what was it, red or yellow? It was red. The, uh, 
was to take and Bet you she still uh, had that, up, huh? Hmm? Bet you she still had that, huh? Uh, yeah, it'd be a rusted. <laughs> 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 I would have that rejection sticker on there, you know. No, it wasn't a classic design like a, a regular Firebird. It was a, the older design that... Uh, but anyways, one thought that uh, I want to proceed with and is the fact of um, at some time in uh, our year of celebration or whatever tied in with other things is I visualized along uh, North and South Main Street on the green space uh, collectible car show. And it grew from uh, hmm. collectible cars, uh, roadsters, this, that, whatever. But now I'm thinking that ideally on one side of this uh, Main Street, whether it's big, I, I'm looking for both North and South Main Street because I think if we're gonna do this, we're gonna do it big. It's going to be the Main Street Car Show and Classic Car Show. Uh, we're going to take and uh, uh, try to get classic roadsters and everything kind of lined up. Uh, we have some people there that do racing, also have some race cars. Also, we can't forget about uh, motorcycles and those kind of things. And also, I've, uh, there are, I've seen like down over at uh, the uh, North Hadley Sugar Shack, there is a large brigade of people that enjoy showing off the tractors. Old tractors, you, Old exactly. Tractors. I mean, what better place? Um, my thought is to take in like one side of each, you know, South Main Street, North Main Street, whatever, lined up with classic vehicles. That's, that's a great idea. We haven't drag uh, raced down North Main Street in a long time. Uh, you know, and, uh, <laughs> they put the light in. So, Jeez, yeah. It was 1976, I think, the last time we did that. Time. Yeah, that, that was, yeah, and so. Uh, so that's what I'm, you know. We had cars back then, right? Yeah, I think so. I think so. But the other thing was the fact that I did get into a person that deals with uh, car shows and uh, uh, judges stuff, and he ju he's a local guy, and he jumped right on. He says fantastic idea, and he's more than willing to take and work on it. When you do when you do onesies like that, I think they go over very big. Well, the the one thing is that it mentally, you know, uh, parking was brought up or whatever like this, and. I'm thinking that, you know, block off, you know, one side of the street, you know, no parking, the other side lined up, and uh, parking over at the Sunderland Elementary School, you know, um, I'll ask Sugarloaf Estates if that, uh, my, our old property there could be used for parking. Um, the elementary, is with the town office building here, you know, people can park in location, yep. and um, we could take and set up food vendors or something like this on one side or whatever, so we could take and mm -hmm. have a large event. Uh, judging could take place, uh, prizes could be offered, and other things. But uh, just, it was like, <laughs> well, we'll concept. be having the motorcycles, we'll be having tractors and farm equipment, and a lot of different types of vehicles. You want to contact Cummington, because the Cummington Fair, they do a huge thing with, like, vintage old That's farm tractors right, and stuff. Right, right. And they might be able to help you out with, um, with that, and with yep. some contacts. Because I also know that uh, the... The uh, uh, people from um, uh, Warner Farm will mm -hmm. be also celebrating their 300th too, and so uh, I want to bring this to their, uh, their attention. Uh, and uh, so, well, they're on vacation now, I think. But anyways, uh, to take a start brainstorming more of this stuff, yep. and when when's a good time that we could possibly have this? Uh, because we're going to be piggybacking on a number of other things on the uh, Chili Festival that weekend. So I don't know if it's going to be too overpowering, but then again, you know. Yeah. So it was okay. How do we, it, who owns that, and what do we have to take and do, or what are logistics and or the policies and procedures for kind of um, taking over that green space? Well, theoretically, it's the towns. It is the towns. Um, but I think the town would have to be a good neighbor, and we should write write an email or a letter to each of the landowners up and down the street and. Let them know what we're planning to do, and see if they have any any uh, particular versions to do right. doing what it is. Right, right. I, I don't think there'd have. I don't think there's any liabilities because the I mean, the liability is. I mean, that is town. It is town property. So. Space, yep. I, I'm, I guess we just have to ensure that the driveways stay open. Right. Talk to the yep. police. I would think too. Right. Yeah. Yep. But I, I would. I would first start that, and maybe we can start with that and see see if there's any pushback from. Yep. You know, from people, mm -hmm. gotcha. get that out there. Because yeah, uh, observing the, you know, the uh, the green belt, there's always um, one side of the street is narrow, the other side mm -hmm. of the street's wider. 
Yeah. And then as it tapers off, you know, you can take and say, okay, fine, you know, this is just whether uh, a food vendor or something will be here or, or whatever, but or else it stops here and then picks up someplace else. And, so. and, we, and we want, one of the things that we're going to be careful, we need to be careful about is is uh, doing anything to the trees oh, on either side. Oh, gotcha. And, yeah. and, yeah. and so, so we would have to stake out, you know, lines and stuff like that. And, and maybe if, if we're, if, if we do it right, we would divert traffic up North Silver Lane, um, mm. and South, Sil you know, yeah. North Silver Lane, Old Amherst, and yeah. just so that we would, you know, keep the cars out of it, so people could like a big block party right through that there. That could possibly be true. True. Yeah, that's an idea. Kind of like a pedestrian you know, zone, and, 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 yeah. and just make that, yeah. and it's, it's possible. Right. We probably have to put a uh, uh, police detail. Oh. And that was one a of couple the other locations. questions coming up. But, uh, you know, my thought is that, you know, when we were marching down and just seeing those cars, it just looked so natural, just lined up on the tree line, you know, these cars. And I could just imagine whether our hood's open and the signage in front of them or something like this, people looking around and just walking around. It'd be a nice family event just to take a look, yep. see around, to make and see. All righty. We can do that, Tom. Okay, um, next thing is going to be... Uh, we're looking at signage on telephone poles and around. A couple of things that we're looking at. We're getting prices on are these, uh, like we have at UMass, those large banners sitting up on uh, mm -hmm. poles and stuff like that there that are, you know, tacked at the top and the bottom. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, Sherry, uh, almost like a, Sherry can actually help you with that problem okay. because when we go to Boston, there's always uh, vendors. Right. So if she if yeah. she has a catalog from Boston, the, oh, the show that we're in, okay. she, she would have a number of names inside there. They have the banners and stuff, Sherry. Mm -hmm. nice. or, or Scott, if you were David, I don't I don't think I have my catalog, but in, in that catalog, there's a list of all the vendors and they... they yeah. We're looking at the uh, kind of mentally thinking that um, we would have these scattered throughout main uh, mm -hmm. uh, entrances to the town. And I don't want to say that, like, you know, right at the very beginning, like on South, um, uh, well, on, uh, by this, uh, on 47 over by the Hadley Town line, right then and there. But where the intersection of, you know, Plumtree Road comes in to uh, Hadley Road around there. So people coming in from Plumtree and coming in that way can see stuff. Same thing, you know, spec out a couple locations uh, throughout the town. Also, Main Street here and over there so that people will start seeing some stuff, you know, 300th whether they're sponsored by um, a company or a person or something. We'll have that information there, what it looks like, God only knows, but, you know, just popping those uh, up throughout the town. And also we're thinking about, I know this has been an ongoing discussion for a number of years, a large sign saying welcome to the town of Sunderland or something like this, something like Hadley has down at the uh, end of the Coolidge Bridge. Mm -hmm. yep. And um, if the possibilities are there to take and, you know, uh, fund one of those babies to go up someplace and, you know, once again, it's it's one thing to fund it and design it and build it, but where to take and pop it. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember Margaret and I talking about that a number yeah. of times a while back. Yeah, yeah. and that was... But and that was, the space was the issue, right? Right, right, right. Is it's so. a state road. You talk to well, them, though. I mean, we have, to find, we have to find the right location. Right, right. And um, So, and as for getting those banners or whatever like this, what's the next step in putting them up on the telephone poles around the area? What do we have to do there? Well, the, the attachment to telephone poles, you're going to have to talk to Eversource. The Eversource is typically, they don't like stuff attached to their poles, so we're going to have to talk to them about that. This is a, this is a uh, Verizon town. Oh, we're a Verizon town. Yeah. We're a Verizon town. So hey, you know, it says on each pole, so yeah. if you scout out a pole, oh, okay. but it'll, the contact information okay. will be right on the pole. We'll have to talk to Verizon. Right. We're a Verizon town. When did that change? Verizon owns the poles in this town. Uh -huh. Verizon does the pole sets in this oh, town. Oh, the Verizon does the poles. Okay. And they, they alter throughout the district. It's co it's complicated. <laughs> Don't, okay. Uh, no. You're going to scout out your poles, it's, it's, then yeah. check them, okay. and then contact How many times we have we had okay. the yeah. pole sets come back and they say, well, Verizon's yeah. not come back to take okay. their poles out. It's yeah. like, yes. it's convenient um, when it's their pole. <laughs> I, uh, I believe that's the case. I don't want to step on uh, our next topic is... Uh, uh, we have a person in town that is willing to take and um, work on 
the creation of the house plaque signs, uh, something <clears throat> well, exactly similar to what was done uh, 50 years ago or 47 mm -hmm. years ago. And that those have held up extremely well, as you see that some of the houses still have and maintain their original signs. But um, this would be a, he would charge for some services, but he would also volunteer some services. And one of the things that he suggested uh, that I said I would look into is the purchase and or getting of, there's a um, highway grade signed plywood or something. Oh, yeah. Is that, and um, possibly, and he says it's very expensive, I would imagine so, yep. because it's highly, highway grade, right. but uh, getting a few sheets of that so that uh, and when the orders start coming in, he can take and use that to take and create his signs. Talk you know. to George. I think. Talk yeah. to George? Talk to George. George can help with Okay. I think they even sell it at Kohl's, I think. You can get you it think at so? different I think places. it's, it's almost like a... Um, just don't try to find marine-grade plywood around. What was that? Marine-grade plywood. That's marine-grade? Oh, no, it's no, not. You can't, you can't find it around here. Okay. You got a mail order that. Uh, you know, another thing about your polls, too, we do have the two that we put up for the fall festival. So right. we have those two at least. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, and that was another thing that we were kind of thinking of that. for, you know, a, a specific uh, high profile event. In that. Right. Okay. okay. The other thing is uh, when we start planning on um, everyone that is working on a proposal or committee and or thought or something that they want to take and do. Um, they're going to have to take them on our committee, uh, put together a proposal for funding mm -hmm. and take them, give a line item budget as to what time, place, date and so on and so forth. What it's going to cost, if it's going to be funded by the committee mm -hmm. and or ticket sales or whatever. And I'm just wondering how are we going to take, how can we address the, uh, the police highway and fire department if they're needed, particularly uh, if police are needed for um, for traffic concerns and or for crowd, no, I don't want to say, crowd, I would like to say crowd control, but they have police officers <laughs> available. Right, for you an know, event. Um, how do we address that? And is that like something that, I know uh, there's been times where the police are like, they, well, they have uh, community um, service, whatever, you know, um, grant money or something like that. But yeah. because we're, we're talking a number of different events sure. that could take up, you know, as for the parade, um, as for the fireworks, as for maybe the car show, and things start building up, we know that we're expecting crowds. It would be nice to have some police presence there to take and assist in parking and or whatever. But um, also, highway department, to help to hopefully for you know trash removal, cleanup, or whatever, uh, posting signage or whatever. So how do we take and uh, deal with that? So if I could, Mr. Chair, we're, we're two budget cycles away, annual town meeting budget cycles away. We, have, we had one small appropriation this year, and we have that in a line item for the 300th. Maybe it makes sense over the next two budget cycles to have um, a line item that's expanded to support some of the buildup, and then the year of the show, right, the year of the year, ensure that town meeting knows that that's that goes away at the end of the upcoming year right it's a and temporary we, we plan on funding yeah. blank but tom creating it's different than actually making sure that the budget is is the budgeting is is correct so over the next couple of years we're going to have to make 20 months we're going to have to make sure that those numbers aren't just you know darts on a board right. that we talk about how many hours what kind of staff what you know what does it really look like and that will come together as a mosaic of this this event this celebration over its different iterations because it's going to be spread throughout right are you going to do like a master calendar of, of events essentially because then you could share that with right with contacts yeah. at the police and right. fire and um, probably you know, go through mm -hmm. you, know, the, you know that's our plan we have things popping up and just thoughts now and right. okay how, okay start working and getting some of the details just like the thought that popped up about you know the car show the mm -hmm. thing that popped up about the uh, uh, leaf pile and stuff like that there that uh, you know just figuring out how do we you know when we take and put our proposal in i know earl is probably going to mention well who's paying for this sure so you know we'll take and put in figures or something like that but 
you know, at least we'll have some documentation so that as the calendar progresses and things start to percolate some more, then we have something to come back with to the finance yeah. and to you folks saying that, okay, this is what we got going so far. I think it's important, Tom, and it, just in your, your short piece a couple of minutes ago, you went across a handful of departments that could be impacted. Right. By having that lost inside the noise of the budget process in the individual departments, it's harder to kind of manage. Right. Okay. But if we have it go in and say, actually, this is a 300th allocation. Oh, got it. And then we, so we, know, we know we've budgeted for blank. Right. It's important to bear in mind as well, you can't carry all those through without without expending them in that, that current year. Okay. We have a line set up right. for right. donations, et cetera. Right. Right. That's, that's a little different animal. But as far as annual town meeting goes, a real right. budget line item, yeah. you get two years. You get right. two budget cycles. Right. I, I, would, I would say, Tom, it would be very difficult, A, the, the, the volume of people. It would be very hard for the sound, town of Sunderland fire or police department to um, staff. Right. Something like that. So the first thing I realize is that you're going to be going outside. Of, we're going to necessarily going to be going outside of outside of town. So what does that mean? It means that um, there there is an organization, CERT, Community Emergency Response Teams. They they um, do other they do other things besides emergencies because they're always training. Um, so you're probably going to have to talk. We we'll probably have to talk to them. They're very. They're usually very involved with a lot of the or, uh, races and stuff. Yeah, who was that? Community CERT, Community Emergency Response Team, and that's run by. It's run out of the FERCOG up in Greenfield. Okay. Yep. So you're gonna have to talk to. So so that that's one thing, and you also have to pro probably talk to other organizations in town, um, and and have them help. But before we do anything, we're probably going to have to talk to the police to find out what what they allow, what they are going to allow, and what they're not going to allow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. And and we don't have a chief yet, so it'll be more right. difficult. Right. That's. Yeah. But Scott's going to give us an update on that soon. So. Okay. 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 Uh, basically, the uh, the last thing that uh, our goal here is that um, we want to take and have uh, work diligently throughout the fall to take and uh, start formulating a lot of this stuff and making you know our thoughts from pencil going to pen and then to take and uh, get a letter to go out for donations, meaning for other mm -hmm. citizens and also businesses in and around the area. And one of the thoughts was to take and send it off with the one of the tax bills. And that's going to be, of course, next year sometimes. And we're looking at, uh, at you know, coordinating some something or other with the tax collector and or whatever to take and uh, have some sort of a document or something like this, an insert, so that we can take and send out next year when the tax bills go out so that we can start finding out how much funding we can actually get. I, uh, it's still somewhat... Uh, in the distance at this point, but uh, the other thing would be to take and reach out to our tax bills, of course, don't go out to Hadley or South Deerfield or Waitley, but you know, to then take and start contacting the major businesses that some of the residents take and mm -hmm. use in Amherst, Hadley, Waitley, South Deerfield, and Greenfield and whatever, some of the bigger banks, whatever. So pretty much that's, a, that's the last thing on my list is, um, you know, we're looking at ideally getting something out at the during the next tax bill send out in the springtime maybe because I think uh, we have taxes going out uh, the thing in about fall. that is fall. not everybody gets a lot, a lot of people get their tax bills so they go right to their mortgage company so they'll never see them it's a big chunk of people who oh, that, so you're gonna lose oh, good point you might want to think about doing like an email campaign the only thing is trying to get email addresses well, yeah, but it's, uh, you could uh, put a link onto the website and set up like a MailChimp account right, right. to do um, mailings, and it'll be free for the number of people you're doing. You put a link on the website, people can click through there, sign up to get emails about the events. Yeah, the yeah, other, that's one of the things that we'll get uh, uh, going with uh, Sherry. Uh, the yeah. other suggestion is maybe to coordinate with the town clerk and mail it out with the census. The census right. goes to that every gets, household. The yeah. tax bill, you have a lot of property. Okay, well, so let's back up on that, Sherry. Uh, the census goes to every household, but not yes. the businesses, correct? 
Okay. Yes. But yeah. you can get business right, um, information right, right. from the town clerk as yeah. well. They have to. Not a lot of those either. So, yeah. you know, compared to the residents. Okay. You're going to have to use a lot of different resources to get the kind of outreach that you're looking okay, for. Okay, okay. So it's not going to be easy just to take and download up. Tax bills, list. the downside of that is yeah. a lot of them are are not exactly right. exactly so. exactly exactly okay great so we've got to rethink that whole thing yeah. okay okay but that's fine so pretty much i'm happy so there next time you schedule tom zimnoski not 15 minutes yeah, no. yeah. What was that? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, shit. schedule for hey, five hey you, <laughs> you came in a few minutes late i got, was 6 30 you got seven oh, we're almost set we're out of here <laughs> There it is. I won't take up any more of your time. See, if you schedule for five, then he'll do 15 or 20 there it is. or so. So there it is. Thanks. So good. That's Great episode. Good. Appreciate it. Sounds like there's quite a bit going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to buy some stamps and check out the picture. There you nice. go. All right. Caitlin. Who uses stamps? Yeah. Who uses Caitlin, stamps? Caitlin Rock. Hey, you can get a with a stamp. There you go. Possibilities. Write it down. All right, guys. Caitlin Rock is from the Board of uh, Health and has an update on a lien. Well, um, I sort of have an update on the lien. Perfect. I yeah. sent in the um, I sent an email um, in, and uh, I did not bring a copy of it. Of course. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, what I ended up doing was I researched the lien and um, researched the letter from the attorney for the uh, property owners, the current property owners of 46 Old Amherst Road. And uh, there is indeed a, uh, a lien on the property from 1968. Um, interestingly enough, the property has changed hands twice. Mm -hmm. Either the attorneys that signed off on it um, either looked the other way, didn't look at all, or whatever. This attorney from Bacon and Wilson is not going to put his license on the line, um, which is a good thing. Uh, I think that perhaps because the other attorneys, if, if they did, realized it's, it's essentially unenforceable. And because back in 1968, this is what I learned through my research, um, there is a certain uh, process for all leads, and it was not followed in 1968. When um, any, anybody <laughs> puts a lien on a property, it goes on for two years, at, uh, and you're able to collect 6% interest for that two years. At the end of that two years, the lien then gets converted by the assessor's office to a tax on the property. It was never converted to a tax on the property. So the value of the, of the first two years essentially from 68 or the original lien or whatever the time frame was. It, but it, that was that's the only way you could collect it. Right. So essentially, there's no enforcement. Um, you know, this goes back to what, 1968, so that would be 1970. 1970. Your two years are up, yeah. Right, with the two years. So, my recommendation. I was probably sitting in this room back then. <laughs> I know it, was I it, wasn't. Well, actually, in the corner. It was a different hour. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, my recommendation, uh, so I, I also then spoke with the, um, I called up. Caitlin? Yes. Can we really do anything? Well, we need to remove the lien. Okay, how do we do that? Okay, so I, I did make an attachment and I put a release of lien okay. on the attachment. Um, I. Cindy said it was printed out and given to you guys. Okay. Um, and the reason I did it for you is because I believe the attorney said he's willing to pay the six hundred dollars. I remember seeing that. I saw the recap in the. So, email. if he's going to pay the six hundred dollars, you just 
signed the release of lien, right. and then I, I called up to Franklin County and I said, what do we do now? It must be downstairs. It just goes and gets filed for $75. Right. Okay. Um, I drafted it mm -hmm. with the signature line empty. The reason I didn't do it from the Board of Health was because when I read the Mass General Laws... We didn't have the Board of Health back then. Well, no, well, they, they actually, a, they signed the Board of Health. Well, this, but it was a selectman, probably. But it said, when I read the Mass General Laws, though, the release of lien has to be from who's owed the money. Huh, that's so interesting. The, so the town's the owed the money. Right. So that's why I didn't, because when I called, Cindy said, no, the, you know, the, the Board of Health has to release the lien. And when I drafted it, because I, I, I tried to draft it, and the, it ha it says I am made whole. Right. Yep. And anyway, you don't. I can. We can redraft it so it just says I'm made whole. You know, we didn't. We don't care. You know what I mean? But the town is made whole, not the board of health. Right. Board of health put the lien on it because they weren't in compliance. Their septic had failed. Yeah. So they could have condemned the property. Right. But instead, they hooked them up. They told them you have to hook up to sewage. Right. The town hooked them up to sewage, and then charged them. Essentially paid for the Board that. of Health put the lien on it to kind of get the money back for the town. The town is who's owed the money, not the Board of Health. We have, there's no mechanism to get money because we didn't do any work. Right. The town did. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I had it for the selectmen to sign yep, because you sense. guys are owed the money. But if, if you're so uncomfortable... Can I, I see I, a piece of paper for a second? It's not on that. No, I know. But can I see that piece of paper? What are you going to do? Easy. Okay. Don't tear it up. <laughs> it's easy. Uh, do, 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 do. So what I'm hearing is that maybe is a recommendation for us to vote to authorize a release of lien by signature for the value? Nope. Yes. Right? And then we, then we can sign and the Board of Health and the office can coordinate with Bacon and Wilson, I guess, or whoever well, it is? here's the thing. Okay, we, at the Board of Health meeting last Monday, author, uh, released, we voted yep. <laughs> to release the lien. Yep, right. We, we, nothing to do with money yep. as yep. far as they're in compliance with... Right, the, the regulations. So I, I, I'm, yep. I'm looking, this is, what I'm, this is what I want, a piece of paper. I am looking for a motion that would release the lien that was placed on 46 Old Amherst Road in 1968 by the Board of Health on and for, yeah, that's it. To just the Board of Selectmen to make a motion to release the lien on 46 Old Amherst Road. Is that, is that, if I could, Mr. Chair, I'll make the motion and if I get a second for discussion. Yeah, yeah that's fine. It, yeah. Just, just to ensure that we're, as part of that motion, we're collecting whatever that back piece is. Right. It's $600, it's dollars $677.30. Right. The $677.30? Yes. Okay. Yep. Again, I think if, if by having it be, yes. Okay. How's that? That's fine. Sure, you like that? Yeah, I like that. So it only took us forty years. Forty-six. Uh, Fifty 46. years. Fifty-six years. Forty-eight years. Forty-eight years. Took us forty-eight years to get there. Yeah. That's yeah. your government in action. <laughs> so. Just to let you know, I'm proud to be on the board that finally helped get this to resolution. Decisive well, action have, taken. Whoever has signing authority. Terry and I will figure this out and Absolutely. get the lien released. So, will, so we have a motion made. And seconded for discussion. Does yep. Any more discussion? No more discussion. So in part of that thing, we're going to, do you want just to have one of us sign or you want Sherry to sign? Or how do you want to do that? Uh, I guess or you it, want all it, to it, sign? It, yeah, we can all sign. Okay. Just like usual. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Feels like doing something from Ghostbusters. Actually, it's kind of it's like a historical mystery being unraveled. <laughs> Way to go, Sherlock. Yeah, don't cross the beams, Tom. <laughs> don't cross the beams. You just collected How, how's that? Six hundred dollars. Right, Caitlin. Well, we also resolved something. Six hundred seventy-seven dollars and thirty really. cents. A long time ago was a lot of money, I guess. 
Okay. It took a long time Caitlin. for us to unravel something else. You can donate we that to the set. 300th fund. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. How do you like that? That was, that was painless. There you go. Almost. Almost. That can be 300th fund seed money. I, I mean, you know, this is some of the, the, you know, people ask about what do you do as a selectman. How do you explain something like that? You know? <laughs> It, it, but you know what's more more amazing? How many lawyers well, that's had looked at this over the year exactly. and it went whoosh, yeah. whose job it was. This is right. quote to well, I had so to whoever, add, And I had to look, I had to dig in the Mass General Laws but to figure the lawyer, out the lien process right. and then the release process. Sure. But whoever the lawyer was, the whoever, whoever the lawyer was that found it. It, yeah, well, Good for them. That gets an attaboy because right. that guy really, or person, or, or whoever he used, she okay. used. The Bacon and Wilson. Right. Did, a did, great, job. did a great yeah. job to find it. So I'd give them an attaboy. Kind of. Right, a girl. Well, that's it. They, <laughs> they, they did what they should have been doing. And, right. Yep. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Have a good night. Thanks so much. <laughs> I don't know how we can top that. I oh, know. I know how we can talk. There's only that. a couple of years We can ago. talk about Open. other post employment benefit trust programs. What? Watch our ratings are going up as we they speak. Are. Oh, yeah, it's so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Maureen. How are you tonight? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm going to give you Sorry about the tardiness. No, no, no problem. Thanks business so of doing business. Yeah, I know. I, that's my, my background, city government. So. From many, many, many meetings. <laughs> All right, Maureen is here to talk to us about uh, how the town of Sunderland can uh, do a good job with our OPED trust program. Right, and I, you're familiar with OPED and all of the elementary basics of, of that, so I don't have to get get <laughs> into that at all. So, so just so it's just so our viewing audience knows, basically what OPED. OPEB is is a town's responsibility to pay long-term costs associated with employment or retired health care retirement health care etc and the town has started setting money aside a little bit right now um, but we're gonna have to ramp up to meet our projected goals and Maureen's gonna help us do that sure and as you're aware GASB 45 that uh, started back in 2007 and implemented probably about 2010, so it's newer, requires you to value it mm -hmm. and then account for it on your, on your financial statements. Uh, more recent news is that it, right now it's a footnote on your financial statements. There's a GASB 75 that down in Connecticut they just adopted um, at that, you know, in the last year. And that's going to require that the liability be on your uh, financial statements balance sheets now. So just like with pensions, they did it with GASB 68. So, so there's increased uh, attention to this liability. Um, and so um, back when GASB 45 was starting, we, HARS, Public Agency Retirement Services, who I work for, uh, decided that we wanted to develop a retiree health care funding trust and OPEP trust on a multiple employer basis with investment pools to bring economies of scale to so that small, medium, and large municipalities, schools, at other types of public agencies could, could use that trust and not have to go about the business of setting up their own trust, buying their own investment managers. If they didn't have enough assets, they wouldn't be able to get the you know, diversification and, and do what GASI 45 is asking you to do, um, they're not requiring it, but to fund the liability. Um, and to do that, you're required under GASB 45, if, if you want to set up an OPEP trust, and consider it an asset against your liability, you have to um, make contributions irrevocable. It's got to be free from creditors, and it's got to be dedicated solely for retiree health care, and that's sort of what our trust is. So I don't want to spend too much time on the presentation, but um, so what we went about doing is we developed the largest private OPEP trust program in the country. Um, and also it's the fastest growing one in New England. I think just in the last year since we've introduced it in New England, we've had over 40, um, you know, cities, towns go into it um, and school and regional school districts as well. So it's growing very rapidly. We're also in California, Texas, New England, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, a few other states. 
and we have, have well over a billion dollars in, in assets and in over 220 clients in the program. And uh, as I mentioned, it's a multiple employer irrevocable trust. It, it meets also Massachusetts general law requirements. And, it's, and we went to the IRS and got IRS approvals. And the reason why we got IRS approvals on it is because this is a unique concept for public agencies, towns, other municipalities to start funding their OPEB liability. And so we wanted to make sure that it met IRS requirements. And if you think about it, um, it's a unique kind of setup. The, f the funding going in is not taxable. Earnings are not taxable, much like, you know, a pension. But unlike a pension, any distributions out are not taxable because of its health care. It's not pension retirement. So it's sort of a unique thing. So that's why we went to the IRS. And we got the IRS private letter ruling on a multiple employer basis. So any you know towns that join are protected by it from day one. And it's just an other level of protection that we do it. And then, of course, we have you know our Massachusetts attorneys that are make sure it continues to stay in compliance. So in essence, what we're, uh, we're proposing is a full service, the only one in Massachusetts, a full service trust program. So you get the documents, you get the trust, you get the investment management, you get in investment pools that, bring, that give you economies of scale at cost that you would never be able to get on your own. Um, and a trustee, U.S. Bank, which is the fifth largest bank in the United States and the largest trustee of OPEB assets, to be in essence sort of like a fiduciary to make sure the trust is run for you know, the exclusive benefit of the retirees and the beneficiaries and all that. that just, so you get the compliance, the investment management, the investment fiduciary, the trustee, and the services. And really, it's at no startup cost. So it's something that on your own would be very difficult to do. So that's the concept behind it. Um, if you go to uh, page five, um, PARS is the trust administrator, so we're the interface, we're the client, uh, you know, we do the record keeping, and we do all the work with you, we come out to meet with you as ever, how often you need, at least annually we do reviews and we're there for any kind of questions, issues you have. And then U.S. Bank serves as the trustee and the, and, and the fiduciary, make sure that the trust agreement is complied with, and it, in essence you're, you're delegating your, some of your fiduciary risk and to, to the trustee, it's been you running the trust yourself. Uh, and, then the, and then our investment manager, U.S. Bank and Service Investment Manager, or Vanguard. Now, uh, one of the popular concepts in Massachusetts is to use these Vanguard pools because we negotiated, because of the level of OPEB assets, we negotiated investment pools that, are at, that start at seven basis points. That's just like less than, you know, one percent. Uh, of assets, um, which is you know incredibly low, and if you were to go to Vanguard and try to get that as an institutional pricing, you would have to have 250 million in assets. But because we have billions in assets, they give that pricing no matter whether you you put ten thousand dollars in the trust or you put 200 million. Well, that's the variation that we have in some of our clients. You still get the same pricing, and, and as the, as the pool grows bigger, the fees go down. So I, I'll show you in a minute why, why a lot of uh, Massachusetts entities like this because it's, there's nothing this low cost in Massachusetts that you can provide or wise. Actually, I got a question. So sure. if you have like the lowest, say you have five million, it looks like it's like a, what, 37 basis points for the, for the lowest, you know. That's right. The lowest level, let's say total. Right, right. That's, um, yeah, exactly. And, but, the, but the investment management fees, they start at seven basis points. But as it grows, it could go lower. Right. So, yeah, yeah. So it's the asset pool. So it's at 37 now, but it's never gone higher. It always goes lower. So as as assets grow in there, so um, yeah. But you got right to the point. <laughs> well, you know. I know. You know. It's funny. Pay attention to it because, yeah. Exactly. So if you think about it, there's there's no there's no startup cost if you adopt the trust program that you don't fund it for a while. There's no fees until such time as you put assets in, and then that's the, the assets. And the assets cover the legal compliance, the trustee services, the investment management, the fiduciary, and all of that. The, the only other options right now in Massachusetts is really for you to have your own trust and get an investment manager. Uh, and or you can go into PRIT, but PRIT, PRIT requires you to have your own trust, and then they're the investment manager. So that's why 
we're very popular in Massachusetts is because you know we provide everything you need and then and yet you have local controls not one size fits all you're not stuck with one investment portfolio if you want to do balanced growth conservative we've had some you know start out in one portfolio and decide they want to go into another just they feel more comfortable conservative about it they can do that they're not stuck I was just flipping through it. Is it all index-based as far as... Uh, Vanguard's index-based. So that's meant to be, if, if that's your priority, really low cost, just mimic the market. Um, although Vanguard is doing some asset allocation, so there's a little bit of their fiduciary within the parameters they have to stay within, but they're picking what you know the funds are using and what percentage and such. So there's a little bit of right, fiduciary in there. Right, but their underlying funds are indexed. And those are very low institutional funds, so you know the expense ratios of those are either well, eight or nine basis points. Right, so it's as low, low as you can pretty get much go, um, and, and if that's what's attractive. If you want more active management, you want to you know sit down with the portfolio manager and and actively manage to try to beat the market. If that's what your interest is, then you would uh, you know then then we would use the U.S. Bank approach. Um, in, one thing to keep in mind is right now, with your actuarial valuation, you're getting a very low discount rate because you're only in fixed income. You haven't put it into an irrevocable trust. Under Massachusetts law, once you put it into an irrevocable trust, then you can diversify your asset allocation mix. So by doing so, the actuary will look at it and say, okay, well, the you know, town has picked a you know, balanced approach, and they may, it's up to the actuary, but they may select a 7 or a 6% discount rate. For every 1% increase in the discount rate, it brings down your liability about 15%. So we typically see, when you start putting funds into an irrevocable trust, a, a drop of about a, thir a third uh, in terms of your uh, OPEB liability. So right now, it's set up that way. The GASB 75, it might change. But right now, actuaries give you credit for just putting some money in, even if it doesn't you know, it, it, it's not significant enough to uh, to sort of bring down the liability. Most Massachusetts and across the country, towns and cities just don't, they're putting in whatever they can, they're playing catch up because right. they never funded it before. So um, so, that, so what we see in Massachusetts and other states is the actuary gives you credit for that. And so just by virtue of putting that money that you now have just in a, you know, your own fund and it's not in the irrevocable trust, by doing that, you'll see it impact your um, your liabilities on you know all other things being equal at your next actuarial valuation. So that's one of the reasons why um, you know we find that um, public agencies want to go ahead and put their money aside in the irrevocable trust. And I'm you know I'm sure you you know you're you're at that point where you're deciding to do that, so you're familiar with some of the benefits of, the, of putting it into an irrevocable trust. So that's the input side. It comes distribution time. We have employees that are out there. The irrevocable trust is a, is a, is a, is a weighted value of money, mm -hmm. and the distribution comes out of the gains from said trust? You can, you have a lot of flexibility in that regard. The, the uh, trust requires that the funds be dedicated towards retiree health care. Yep. Yeah, so that means you can take it only out for reimbursing the town's cost. You can have the trust pay directly to health care providers if you want. Some of our clients actually have us pay directly to retirees, they direct us. So those are the three permitted uses of it. Okay. Um, there's various ways that the trust is used. The most common way, because I mentioned you know, you're playing catch up, is to just set money aside and hold it in there for a while and get the benefit of you know, accumulation of those assets, continue to put funds in as you can every year. Um, but you don't have to if you have a, a year where you can't, you know, you, you know there's, no, there's no requirement that you contribute, there's no requirement that you contribute a certain amount, and there's no requirement that you take a certain level of distribution or timing of it. Um, but there's some that basically run their pay-as-you-go through there. So meaning they'll, they'll take a distribution out every year. Some do it monthly, you know. Some use us to basically pay the retiree health care. Uh, but I would say the majority of them are just haven't been taking distributions, they're sort of playing catch up. Um, there is, you know, some are using kind of investment returns in that way where they'll put money in at the end, beginning of the year and then take out whatever investment earnings 
um, they'll take it. But generally, they're putting more than their pay as you go, and they're putting extra, and then taking a portion out for pay as you go. That way, they keep accumulating some assets. Right. Yeah. Thank you. That Sorry. sort of leads to my next question. What, what kind of returns are you looking at roughly so far? Um, the returns, I can actually give you that. I didn't bring all the detail on that. Um, the returns have been over the last five and seven years have, have hit their targets. So, like for example, the Vanguard ones, uh, ta they target about a 7% rate of return. Yeah. Um, and this is looking long term because we're talking about a long term right, exactly. time horizon. Right. Um, but for the last five years, um, they've hit their targets. This last year, they did not hit their targets, but they were positive at the end of the year, okay. which was unusual. Uh, the conservative, because it's 20% equities and 80% and fixed income, that stayed positive, but over the last five years that has not done as well, but it is its target, which is about 5%. So roughly they're targeting at, of the conservative portfolio about a 5% return over time, the balanced around a six, at, you know, percent, that's what they're targeting over a longer term, like, you know, they're looking at least 10 years on that, and then 7% on the growth. Um, and really it comes down to, they're gonna be close, uh, but the way we talk about it is, um, it, how much comfort do you have with volatility? Right. Right. One will give you a little bit more. You have to expect a bit more volatility. You know, balance less less volatility than growth. Conservative is very conservative. Um, you're you're basically primarily in the fixed income market. Some feel comfortable with that. They you know they felt comfortable with with that. They've started out in conservative and then they've gone into balance or growth. If if, you, if Vanguard was in front of you, for example, or U.S. Bank, they'd say go balance to growth because it's long term. But it's really up to the comfort level that you have and what your target rate of return is over time, what you feel comfortable with. Um, so, there, uh, you know, like this year, um, you know, growth did a little worse than the other. <laughs> you know. It happens, so, you know, in the markets, yeah. Yeah, and funny because we had so many in Massachusetts go in, and some of them were like, it was, they had a couple dicey months there after they started putting funds in, but you have to just remind them this is long term. Yeah, exactly. You know, don't look at the monthly. Just don't worry about it, and it's don't treat it like your funds, you know, your general funds, because it's a long term. It's you're really uh, investing in these funds in the best interest of your employees and retirees. So you have a fiduciary obligation, and that's where you allow the trustee to take a little bit of that hat for you to make sure it's protected. That's the benefit of it. Any questions? I do. Maureen, I see .org at the end of your mail. Are you guys a corporation or are you an agency? Um, our or? trust is, is, is basically a, a kind of a multiple employer nonprofit trust. So technically that is, uh, you know, for the, it's, you know, a vote of the, the members of it can make changes that they want. So private, that is, but our organization itself is private. Okay. So yeah. private nonprofit or private for profit? Private, private for profit. Private for profit. And you're based where? We're based, um, our headquarters in California, but our East Coast office is in Boston, and then we have a South Carolina office. I could follow up, Mr. Chair. Um, Pardon me? I, I could just follow up. Yeah. So who are your competitors outside of the public sector? Um, outside of PRIT, yeah. you say? Uh, in Massachusetts, PRIT is our public sector competition. How about um, private sector or private And CalPERS is in California, if you think they're, about they're, a huge yeah, right. competitor we've got there. Um, uh, and then Bartholomew and Associates, which is an investment manager, and uh, you know, obviously they're involved in, in managing funds for various towns. So uh, they will provide the investment management. They won't provide all the services that we do. So we're kind of a turnkey. Um, and then um, the other one that we've run across is Rockland Trust. Those are about it, really, that we've, we've really run across in Massachusetts. We have different competitors in Rhode Island. The state of Rhode Island basically uh, contracted with us to do a multiple employer trust in that state so we have we started that about nine months ago and have yeah we have about so we're doing the same kind of concept and we have about 22 that have joined in, in Rhode Island so um, but uh, there the, there's a few other competitors uh, but primarily right now we're just taking over because they've been running their own right. and they realize we can bring down your costs significantly sure so that so a number of them are moving over um, there that already have trust set up. Good, Mr. Chair. If, if uh, the town of Sunderland decides to pursue this, how does the town of Sunderland get out if we're unhappy? Uh, good question. Uh, it's a 30-day notice, 
So we have no restrictions on you staying in, and where there's no commitments like there would be with Pritt to put a certain amount of money in and all that. Uh, and uh, so there's no 30-day notice. The only issue for you, and this is not our issue, it's the IRS, yeah. you can't just take obviously the funds back. Understood. You, you can basically transfer it to a like trust, yeah. which is another Section 115 trust, which is what this is, Section 115 trust. So, um, yeah, we're not going to take it and put it in the highway budget. It's yeah, you get no, trouble. I totally, a little trouble. Yeah, to, that, to, yeah. No, I totally get it. I yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the concept of irrevocability, though, you bring up distributions, is a lot of that's the one of the biggest hurdles. It's irrevocable. We can't take it if we need it. But technically, you can go back a few years, look at what your you know retiree health care costs have been, and take distributions out. So it's irrevocable for everything but retiree health care. So there is some flexibility, like during bad budget times, we have had that happen. Some that started funding and then they hit, were hit by the Great Recession, and they did start to take some funds out, and then they started to build it back up. So it's not completely, you know, it, intractable in terms of, its, of your ability to use it. So that term, you know, irrevocable, it, you know, if you can go back a few years and say, you know what, I need to reimburse for these last few years. So that gives you a little bit of flexibility that, that um, it's not stuck in there because some think I can never get it out. Right. Yes, you can get it out when you want it, right. but you know for certain purposes. I'm trying to put, the, trying to help uh, define the parameters of the relationship. That's all. The right, facts. right, right. And, we, and we, as a trust administrator, basically, if there's any requests for distributions, you just you send us um, a form saying we want a distribution and show backup documentation that it's for retiree health care, and then we just tell the trustee yep. go ahead and pay them. So it's a fairly simple process. So. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good. Thanks. Dave, all set? Yep, all set. Sherry? Maureen, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. your time. Appreciate that. Thank you. Big, it's a big step for our, uh, yeah, for our town. Yes, it is. All right. Yeah, and I have an extra copy if you need it. Uh, we got printed ones. So I know you had got it. Yeah, I know I mailed it, emailed yes. it. So yeah. yes. thank you very much. for Appreciate your time. Thank you, Maureen. Thanks so much. Have a good night. OPED is a big thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, minutes, uh, April 29th, 20th, 27th, and July 11th. We'll start with April 29th. Uh, motion. Uh, I'll second the motion. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Sherry, 3 0. To June 20th. Uh, Way back machine here. I like it. <laughs> Motion on those. Uh, um, I'll second the motion. A motion made and seconded. Yeah. All those in favor, acceptance of June twentieth. Signify by saying aye. 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 Sherry, three zero. June twenty seventh. I'll make a motion to accept the minutes of the twenty seventh. Ah, Scott beat you this time. Ha! I figured I'd mix it up. Us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Second. Harder for the uh, clerk to record all of <laughs> Tom Fuller. All over the map. Shenanigans. <laughs> yeah, motion made and seconded for the June 27th minute meetings. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. And finally, as I was relaxing on the beach in North, uh, North Carolina, these fine gentlemen and Jerry had a meeting on July 11th. Motion. I'll move the motion. Move to accept the minutes of July 11th. Uh, second. Nice. Motion made and seconded. Two sides. And now that the state says I can vote on minutes, even though I wasn't here. Ah, oh, thanks. Make to that never made sense to me, but not even gonna ask a lot of things that. in the state of Massachusetts <laughs> don't make sense. All those in favor of the uh, July 11th minutes, please signify by saying aye. 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 Three zero. Surprise. Okay. Next up. Uh, board of Selectmen update. Scott? Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could, I've uh, met with uh, Eric Demetropoli, Demetropolis uh, late last week. Our schedule's finally uh, coordinated. Uh, we exchanged the first pass at uh, draft contracts and a combination of term salaries. Uh, the provisions for vehicle allocation uh, are all points of discussion. Uh, Sherry will be contacting the board first thing in the morning about some of uh, the positions that were put forward. And uh, I'm hoping to meet with him this Friday to come back with us. what's effectively our counter offer. So, Scott, the days where we just say, would you like the job, and somebody says yes or no, those have long passed. Uh, these 
discussions are really professional and very friendly. We all recognize the timeline, but there's no handshake. Just walking in the door saying, thanks, I'll take it. Yeah. Doesn't work that way that anymore. Simple, huh? Doesn't okay. <laughs> Thank you, Scotty. David? Um, just waiting to hear on the, the, our solar stuff is reaching its final stretches. So just working on the final finalizations of paperwork. So hopefully we'll have some good news shortly on that. So moving ahead. Okay, I'm going to update on South County EMS. Hey. Um, we had a meeting Thursday night. We have a few new members of the South County EMS Board of Directors, and hey. they are uh, Kip Camosa, Trevor McDaniels, um, Carolyn Ness. If that sounds familiar, that's the Board of Selectmen in the yeah. town of Deerfield. <laughs> the board that before the meeting said that we need to diversify who they appoint. Uh, and also Jonathan Edwards, uh, Randy Sibley um, had been on since the beginning and Randy's taken a break. So Jonathan um, was appointed by the town of Deerfield. So I, I like just very briefly, that, and this is, please understand this is my Statements not representative of the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Sun. Tom Feigenkevich's Board of Op. Um, the Board of Oversight is a working committee, um, and there's a lot of things that happen. One of the key members of that committee was Matt Russo from the Town of Deerfield. Matt, Matt, and I, if I, I think if you were to ask both of us when the process started, we were not a fan of one another for various reasons. Um, but what one thing became very obvious during the process is Matt Russo knows EMS service and how to how to run a service. Prior to the appointment of the new group, I wrote the chair on, of Deerfield Board of Selectmen an email and and, and, and asking um, that Matt's service previous to the Board of Oversight of South County EMS. Um, plus his exemplary of service on the Board of Oversight be taken into account and that I and I asked if if he could be if they would reappoint him because of his critical um, knowledge knowledge that that man has um, it didn't happen um, I can say that at the the last meeting Thursday night Matt did show up and I, I know he's not going to desert it but I did make the statement and and I haven't talked to David and Scott because we can't talk to one another because of our open meeting law. But my opinion, um, if Matt cannot be a member, um, I I offered and I talked to Matt about this. I offered to resign and appoint him as Sunderland rep, as Sunderland representative. That is my personal um, belief, strong belief on how much he affects our South County EMS and the operation. Um, I did talk to the chair, Deerfield, and I was asked to hold off from doing that, and I will respectfully respect that request, so at this time I won't, I won't resign. And I would have to talk to David and Scott also um, to see what their feelings are. But Matt is outstanding, and that I'm not even talking about Mark. Gilmore, uh, who has been involved s since the very beginning, and that that's that's an election thing that happens. We all accept, all of us that have ever been elected, accept that that you can be on, and when your term is up, things change. Um, we can accept that. Mark accepts that. We all accept that. That can happen. Um, I, and I don't know if I, I I didn't even I didn't expect Mark to be appointed. Um, but we know that can happen, and we accept that. But Matt Russo is an amazing, um, strong advocate for South County EMS, and I would definitely, I, I wouldn't have a, wouldn't think twice about stepping aside and appointing him. Um, but we did have our last meeting. Um, one of the things um, in the last. Um, month is our last report uh, and I don't have the email with me uh, with the report 
but there were five cardiacs um, during that time. There was five cardiacs, and we had three uh, saves. I don't know if they're mentioning that tonight or in the, at the Deerfield Board of Selectmen meeting to let their people know, but I want people to know that that's well, well, well above the national average, and that and that's showing what our department. It's our department. Our, the residents of the three town is what they're doing right now. To have three saves and three saves out of five, it's amazing. I also want to tell people that um, if you had an opportunity to read the news lately about a, a very unfortunate thing that occurred up in the in the river, I, I can also tell you that these young men, and for the most part, they're young men and women that serve on our paramedic uh, force. If anybody thinks um, that it's not an emotional thing for them to work so hard to try to bring someone back and to lose someone, you're mistaken. There, there's a lot of things that happen. It is emotional. It's emotional for our police. It's emotional for our firefighters also. And and I would ask that if you see if you see these guys on the street, these men and women on the street, tell them that they do a good job. They they. It's okay. It's okay for you to tell them that they do a good job. They'll appreciate it, um, and because they are doing a, they are doing a wonderful job. I can also tell you that we uh, looked at the final year-end budget to date. Um, some people had predicted that the South County EMS would have five hundred thousand dollars of reserves. Um, that's not true. Um, and if anybody wants to look at the numbers, they can go to the town of Deerfield and they get the numbers. But we didn't have five hundred thousand dollars in reserve. Um, that was that was um, an incorrect statement. Um, but sometimes we don't acknowledge incorrect statements because it's easier to say incorrect things uh, and then never correct the the stuff that said out of out of out of hand. Um, so we're getting better on doing the budgets. We're getting better on how we're putting the budgets together. Um, and I would also say one thing that that our, in the town of Sunderland, the chief of police he doesn't worry about um, unemployment, how much it costs, for, um, how much is being spent on unemployment. Doesn't, doesn't worry about how much is spent on um, insurance doesn't and a lot of those things our em it doesn't also doesn't worry about how much revenue is coming into the police department or fire department ems director has seen that so i i would challenge i would challenge anybody that questions a job that an ems director does i put it there it they're different responsibilities but they're similar responsibilities and i think right now the um South County EMS is, uh, we're trying to find a full-time home. Um, I believe the town of Deerfield is in negotiation with uh, the town of Whiteley. I heard they met a couple times, or at least once. Uh, we discussed the plans the other night. Um, maybe, maybe, hopefully we're moving forward on that. Um, but I only can say on that, time will tell. So that's, that's the update on South County EMS. Any questions? Uh, do you have a timeline, Mr. Chair, when you're thinking uh, one or two meetings before you reach out to Matt, uh, or there's conclusion on that? I was, I, I was asked for two or three months' time. Okay. Okay. And and I we will we'll discuss that. Yeah. I I just want to show that that's the res the amount of respect I have for that man. Well, I I, I applaud your uh, generosity, and I agree with Matt's in not just his institutional knowledge but passion for the service. I think it would it's be a, a very it's, big loss. It's, it's, it's an amazing I, loss. No, I, it's actually, I, you know, I got a, on hubris. I got a question for you guys. Do do you think that, for an instant, that Matt would vote to do something contrary to the betterment of the service? Not and nice. if we're better in the service, aren't we making it better for the town of Sunderland, Deerfield, and Waitley? Well, and, and that for me has been the guiding <laughs> principle for this whole thing is the service that we provide. And you look at the statistics. Uh, all you have to do is read the reports and they yeah. bear out what it, it reinforces the entire goal of why we set this out. Yeah, it is. And, and the charter to do it. And, it's and all about service. My, my, only, my only, and I said it at the last meeting, my biggest, my biggest problem is that 
we're we're not thinking we're not we're not addressing the needs of our staff right now we, you know a, after go after going I, i'm sure anybody out there that's ever been on a, a it had been a firefighter been a police officer been an ems uh, um, if, if you've been in the the service and you've been on a call where where it, it's a life or death and you 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 understand if, if you lose somebody the 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 depth of your feeling when when you can't when you can't help when that's your sole when that's your sole goal is to help somebody and when you can't you're physically let down there's a physical thing we should be working with those guys after a call like that putting programs in place to help to help our staff and and we're not we're 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 arguing about things we're arguing discussing whatever you want to say we're, we're, that that really were taken care of five years ago when, when Baxter originally made the proposal. And we're still revisiting those same things in seven. Instead of moving our service forward, we're, we're, we're stuck. And, and it's very difficult right now. But we're going to move forward. It, it, we are going to move forward. And, and actually, I do think, I, I do think that the, uh, the, the present members from the town of Deerfield are working in that direction also that to make it a better service and and that's i truly have to hope that that's what's happening mm -hmm. okay town administrator updates um i have a couple for you uh we did receive another technical assistance grant um, through the community compact and uh, that's to work with the FERCOG to develop the town's uh tra transportation prioritization plan <laughs> Um, and that uh, grant value is $30,000. Um, so the contract documents were downstairs for you to sign and uh, we're hoping to get started probably within the next month or so and have that plan complete um, by, June, uh, by January 30th. And Excellent. then from there we will proceed into the implementation uh, portion of the um, project. You know, one one thing I like it, it's I thank you for mentioning that the the FERCOG, and it's not the FERCOG in particular, but I noticed in the paper the other day, the FRTA, yep. um, the Franklin Regional Transit Author mm -hmm. Authority, was actually changing their routes mm -hmm. around a little bit, mm -hmm. and one of the things was that they were actually going to Sugarloaf Estates, yep. um, and they were going to leave off some of the passengers. Instead of going all the way to the university, they were, one of their routes went to the university every day. They're going to now leave off people at, they, they've worked with the PBTA, they're going to leave people off at the Sugarloaf Estates, so they're going to be able to make more runs, whatever that means, between uh, Greenfield and Sunderland. I think it go, I th actually think, I think it goes through Montague, but I'm not 100% positive. But I think if um, people are resident, Maybe, maybe Sherry, if you could talk to the FRTA and get get that schedule, and maybe we can post a schedule. But we may have actual, we may have more options to get to uh, Greenfield now, and 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 throughout the county, working with the FRTA now that they're dropping people off at the uh, Sugarloaf Estates. That was mentioned at the transportation meeting that I attended today at the was COG, it? and uh, the new schedule starts August first. Okay, but I um, thought that so was good. That was a good thing. Yeah. Right, because you can get more people back and forth exactly. rather than having one. Now, did they tell you where the route was running? They didn't, but I will find out. Can you that find out? Because I, I was wondering if it was running through Deerfield up to Greenfield or if it was running up through Montague, because that would make a difference also, because that, that may make uh, availability of the, the senior center to some of our seniors a little bit easier also. I bet we can get a link for the schedule and the route from them and pop it onto our website. Yeah. Okay. What else you got? And then the other thing today at that TIP meeting um, at the FERCOG, they voted to um, amend the TIP. And Sunderland is back on hey. for 2020. We had dropped to 2021. Right. Um, but the um, state has come up with some funds for the Charlemont Route 2 project. And they're going to take care of that all in one year instead of two years. So, Excellent. Uh, nice. Yeah. It's um, helped out a lot of the communities who were kind of pushed down. Um, I've heard a big party that Tom Zamoski plans on uh, the 300th. Yeah. We're going to have to sh we're going to have to get that place yeah cleaned up, up a little bit. Yeah, I think so. 
that's about it, working to um, update the community development strategy. Our last update was 2012, so you probably saw an email that I sent around to all the department yeah. heads asking them to, to take over. Okay, thank you, Sherry. Mm -hmm. All right, next up is a review draft RFP for lease for office space in the town of Sunderland building. Who wants a lease space, Sherry? Um, FCAT is interested. In FCAT. This. No comment from the board back there, huh? So <laughs> <laughs> what I put together. Is... <laughs> I mean, this is pretty much what we discussed before, right? Yeah. Right. I... A number of times in the past. Yep. Scotty, any questions? I had a conversation with Sherry about utilities versus you know rent rent. In the, in, and then in-kind service versus rent rent and that language is inside here and it makes a great deal of sense yeah yeah I would agree what do you think I, I love the idea. <laughs> and, and again we just pay pay what you use right you, use you fees we're not separately metered we can come up with a formula cost per hour really simple I mean for us it's not a big deal I mean we're not No, no I mean it's not a big deal for Chris because what I'm trying to tell you is that it is right now we have we have space and and we we want to see our town hall our town hall use we, we believe there's a synergy when you're bringing people in I mean you come down here in a, in a you come down here in the springtime and the fall time and you see the people outside playing baseball or soccer or and you got people going in and out of the library and you got people yeah. coming to town hall and, and you got meeting and it's it's bringing people together and people coming together usually means good things for us so i i just see it as a win 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 um my only concern and i, and I spoke to you guys about, about the past is that i still think that fcat and frontier have a lot of natural tie-ins and i hope we don't lose that tie-in because i I, I can see all the great kids that we've had sitting behind that control yep. panel, you know, and, and, um, and, and, you know, we get to see them go away to college and, and we, and we share, we share with, we share those experiences with those kids and, and I just think it's a great thing. And, you know, we get to talk to their parents once in a while and, you know, follow up with them. So I, I just hope we don't lose that. That's the only thing. All right. Do you want us to do anything with this? Just um, to make sure that you've looked at um, the space that they're looking to occupy and if there's others in the space. Mm -hmm. We need a plan. We need a little bit of a relocation or, plan. Or how we're relocating yep. them. Okay. Start talking to them. Okay. Okay. I don't have a problem with that. All right. Anything else? The only thing under here I don't see is a, is a term and then an exit piece. Okay. And Term and that's, exit. That's pretty easy. Both that's, ways? That's, stan that's standard stuff. But both ways. Both ways, <coughs> absolutely. Yep. Okay. That makes sense. You want to review goals next meeting? Yep. Yeah. We'll review goals next meeting. Okay. Are you ready? Any questions? You think you can live with that, Chris? We can live with it. All right. All right. One other thing, Mr. Chair. Shoot, Scott. I. I uh, said that in this uh, particular period of histrionics that I was going to say something every single night. So, <laughs> we're at the height of our politicking season right now. Uh. It's really important that the electorate understand politicking is not governing and governance is even harder. Governance occurs in this empty room right now. While we hope you all pay attention, I would hope we stay away from our politicking, take that bitter pill and be informed as we head into a real election, this quadrennial circus that we're dealing with, invariably through temperament affects what happens in this room because we all get wound up. So be smart, be informed, and participate in governing, not politicking. I'm gonna say it every other week. And then when we come into our regular schedule, I'm gonna say it every week. 
I said I, it to my 21-year-old son I, yesterday. I just think uh, watch the process from afar. <laughs> we have we have we we have um, a few residents of our town that are very very uh, involved in this part of the politics, and which has always been kind of a foreign concept to me because it's so so far away. There goes the press, right? Yeah. <laughs> Ciao. See ya. And 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 I know. I know one of those was uh, uh, a dear friend uh, who passed away, and and um, and I remember at her um, funeral, her daughter, one of her daughters, saying how much she uh, would have um, enjoyed seeing Hillary. As uh, nominated for the presidency, that and Carolyn Perry's uh, thing, and she she was thinking about that 20 years ago or whenever. I I, I, I just um, I I I know um, there's people that are passionate on both sides. Sure. Um, and and I I think it's I, I sometimes I wish our our news media would. Give us news differently than the way they do. Different cycles, sure. Um, but we're all hmm. we're all attuned to a, a two-minute soundbite or less, sure. ninety seconds, sixty seconds, whatever it is. And and I would just say that one hundred and forty characters. One hundred and forty characters. <laughs> I, I I would I would I would hope. I think what Scott's saying is that people spend a little time and, and get through the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. um, and understand what's being put in front of them. Kierkegaard said, we make up for volume what we give away with our intelligence. Well, and, and I'll just say too that, and this has nothing to do with parties or anything, democracy takes work. It's sure. not, you can't just check in every now and yep. then and complain and then drop out. It's not gonna work unless you get involved. Sure. And that's a lot more than just showing up every now and then to right. vote because you're angry about something. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, and, and I will, David basically hit the nail on the head. And I still think about that first election in Iraq where, where people had to dip their fingers in indelible purple ink and knowing that someone in their communities may not think it's the best thing that they went and voted they they did it and they were proud to vote um and and we as people that have elected have have had our name on the ballot we have a responsibility also yep. just like the people above us they have a responsibility to give us good governance as you said scott is that that's their responsibility and and un unfortunately I don't think we win. I don't. I personally don't think we win when we quit question someone's patriotism. No. I don't think that's usually you're done. running for the president of the United States, and you can be called not that you're not a patriot, that you that you have no patriotism. I think there's a direct relationship to the meat behind the substance of whoever's doing the questioning. Of, I that's usually something that gets resorted to when there isn't something. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure Ronald Reagan and and Bill Clinton. Um, we're both patriots in their own right, so <laughs> maybe hard to in their own prove own that. Right. But um, I, I, if you talk to certain people, but I think both were patriots, just like I think uh, both of the Bushes and, and and our president today, Obama. I, I think those they're patriots. Um, not that I agree with everything each one did, um, but we support their elections, and we don't want to see what happened in Turkey, because I don't want no. to be run by guns either. So, that being said, there you go. motion. Motion to adjourn. Second. Whew. After all that, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. We have a 3-0 vote to get out of here, and we have an 806 adjournment, Sherry. Oh, look at that. That's too early. we got to go back and do nope. some stuff. Never too early. <laughs>